Francis, hallo? Another episode of Moped Outlaws with Greg and Mark yeah. featuring improved lighting and sound. It's, it's really going to awesome. get better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because um, I noticed I need blackout curtains, and those obviously aren't blackout curtains. So those are going to flip over to this side, this, this side, and then I'll put blackout curtains there. But we can still see your lovely face way better than in the past. I'm super stoked about that. Yeah. Welcome to the show, Greg. Thank you, Mark. It's good to be here. I'm really ready to be obtuse and obstinate. Are you ready for that? Uh, I'm never ready for that and always ready. <laughs> well, what if you're I did my meditation part? practices today, so the, the door is open. Or as they say, Tim Schill. Tim Schill? Mm -hmm. I'll have an order of Tim Show, please, with my sake. Yeah, you you would. You always have an order of Tim Show available. <laughs> Yay for me! Um, that reference goes back to a book. Um, hey, let's Grapes talk of about Wrath. That book. In the book, oh. someone says Tim Shell, and what do we find out? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a Yiddish word for the way is open. All things are possible. That's awesome. That was from Grapes of Wrath. Well, that's the literary reference. I'm sure it goes back further than that. What's the story he wrote um, about the two friends and one of them is kind of mentally yeah. challenged? Grapes of Wrath. That was Grapes of Wrath? I think so. No, Grapes Tell of me Wrath. about the rabbits, George. No, <coughs> that's not Grapes of Wrath. Is it? Oh, well, if you knew, then why did you ask me? No, because I know Grapes of Wrath is the family that's leaving the Dust Bowl. Mm -hmm. All right. And I We're don't three think... minutes in, and the Google is being evoked. Yeah, because um, grapes... someone has to be right. Um, Who is it right? Yep. We live in America where only one person can be right and everyone else is wrong. And I'm willing to be the wrong group. I'm um, all I'm willing to be the wrong person too. And it's not true about America that we all one person always has to be right. You know in what? Fact, the whole premise is that we can both be right at the same time and not be a big deal. I loved um your passion in our last episode with uh, the gentleman and you were like, I love America and I am not going to let this just slide by. And I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, you go. Yeah. Mark. For those of you who didn't listen to last week's episode, this is a good chance to tune back into that. And uh, yeah, but out. lucky for me, I get to be the right one. Yeah. It's the narrative, which traces the migration of an Oklahoma Dust Bowl family to California, the hardships, blah, blah, blah. It's, um, that's, yeah, it's not the other book with George that you're referring to that I was trying to remember is like, oh, damn it. This is my opportunity to look ignorant in front of all of you about literary history. So I'm so grateful. I'm going to get to learn something that I should have known already. Um, just look up the quote or shall I, would Henry you like Rowe, me to take over the Google of, Eden, life, of mice and men? Oh, there it is. You're right. That makes me the mouse and you the man in this case. Ah, Great. Victory! Victory! All yeah! right. Red is your state, appetite sated state. yet? What? Is your appetite sated yet? No, no. Well, good. Let's keep going then. Let's roll. Look what <laughs> I'm having for breakfast. Uh, Is that? It's not a Pop-Tart. Oh, it is a pop tart <laughs> brand. Pop tart brand. Yep, this is wow. a real life pop tart. Is it mocha chocolate? Mocha taka laka naya Sunday. <laughs> awesome. I'm having 
a protein shake with cocoa powder, blueberries, beet powder, and various other things like bananas and almonds and almond milk. Wow. And you know what's beautiful is both of our breakfasts have the equal amount of nutritions. <laughs> Nutrients. Nutritions. Little nutritions running nutrition available. Yeah. Oh no, you froze up. All right. I'm not frozen. Groovy. Okay. Groovy. Okay. We're Yay. Back. All, All right. right. So here we are. Um, for those of you who haven't figured it out yet, we don't have a guest today. I'm kind of digging I... that because I miss just hanging out and talking with Greg. All right. That's beautiful. Yeah. And um, thank you. You know, we had a great conversation. And one of the things that I've been walking with since we had it, because I was like, well, why would you want to interact with a person who's got this sadistic thing going on? And you're like, well, that's just a small piece of who you are. I was like, oh. Yeah, that was from a conversation that wasn't really on the air. No, that was like a week ago. And yeah. uh, there are hidden shows that we don't release for those of you who are wondering. And if you ask us very nicely and maybe write that on the back of a hundred dollar bill, we'll consider it. You know, that reminds me, we started an account for um, Patreon. And that's as far as that's gotten. There's, we got sticks in the fire. We have sticks lying by the fire. We have sticks that we talk about that are out in the forest still. There's yes. Sticks. Everything's waiting for the right time and the right season. Yes. God bless America. You know what I felt like today when I was thinking about the show was I was like, oh, you know what? I really want to do a movie show with you where we just talk about movies. The podcast is just movies. Every week we talk about a different one. That'd be and awesome. That'd I be think awesome. that'd be really fun. And so yeah. if you're hearing this and you think that would be fun, be sure to write in. And if we get one response, we'll do it. Yeah. One email response at the host at mopedoutlaws.com. Otherwise, fuck you all. Just sit there and stew in your wine and what are those called? Chartreuse boards? Chartreuse boards. <laughs> the I don't know. Oh, board, charcuterie the... boards. That's what you're going for. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, yeah, what is that word? <laughs> <laughs> Between you and of mice and men and me with the pronunciation of charcuterie, charcuterie? We're, we're doing good. That's how you say that? Charcuterie? That's my pronunciation of it. It may, as, may or may not be as accurate. A charcuterie board. Boy, that was sure caught on in like a Gen X shot to the arm. Yeah. Well, it's easy. You slice up some cheese, you slice up some salami, and you charge 20 bucks for it. And there you go. That's beautiful. It's not Very hard. Um, neither am I. Um, it'd, be hey, fun, it'd be fun to do restaurant reviews, too. Like we go out to the restaurant, we have the meal, we talk to the chef, right? Speaking of, our 200th episode is coming up. Wow. Yeah. Are we going to do another road trip? Yeah, let's do it. All let's right. get, like, actually get out of the county. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. <laughs> and I was thinking of bringing the video camera. And, okay. Yeah, so that... Um, all right, so yeah, John Steinbeck, mice and men, killing little furry things and people, and God bless America. Right. And breakfast. Breakfast with Mark and Greg and our brains. Yeah, on Pop Tart. Yeah. This is your and brain. This is your one brain. of the great things about uh, one of the great things about our this is the contrast in personalities and the contrast in hair. Like I am so smooth right now with my almond oil on my my nice smooth head. I'm Greg, who didn't wash his hair this morning. And, and it's funny because I love it the way you have it right now. And I think you don't like it that way. Am I right? No, I like it okay. Good. This is okay with me. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, this has like some health to it. I don't okay. like it when it's really dry. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Old people's hair follicles dry out. Maybe I wouldn't know because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not old yet. Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah. Hey, speaking <laughs> of, you crossed the 60 line, didn't you? 
I crossed the 61 line. Yeah, that's what I thought. In March. I'm 61. Yeah. How many um, posts are there on the Golden Gate Bridge? This many? No. Um, I think it's 115. Oh, I'm wow. not certain of that. What Greg's talking about is there's lamp posts that are on the per, the per pedestrian walkway and the bicycle walkway, which is on the west side, and the pedestrian walkway is on the east side if you're on the Golden Gate Bridge. And each one of those lamp posts is numbered so that when maintenance needs to go fix something, like change the light bulb, they know, oh, po post 121 is out. And what I do is every year I have a tradition of walking out to the post that is the name, the number that of my age and excuse me, taking a photo with it. And then also taking beautiful photos of the Bay area. And it just so happens my birthday's in March. So springtime weather, it's usually clear and sunny, which is uh, un amazing. Like, I think I've got a 15 year streak of it always being sunny on my birthday. When I go do this always thing is in the birthday. even years, like next year, the post is going to be on the opposite side, and I can't actually walk out to it. So I walk out to the one that's across from it. Wait, well, you can walk on either side of the bridge. No, you cannot. You can only take a bike on the other on the bicycle side. Oh, maybe you have to ride bikes on one year and walk on the other year. Yes, I could do that. Yeah. I could do that. So, but what you do is you walk out and you look across the bridge at the even numbered. Is it even yep. or odd? The odd number is the one on the bicycle. The even number is on the bicycle side. Right. So you look across and you go, there's 62 way over there. Right. It's like a, an analogy of your life. Where well, what I know is I haven't crossed the halfway point yet. Ooh. So theoretically, it means there's 120 some odd, but they're on both sides. So it's a little bit hard to tell yet. I know that I got at least... 50 more lampposts that I could visit if I lived that long, which would be 111 years old. That's a long time to live. It seems more plausible these days as our technology and, and ideas of nutrition get more <laughs> prominent. <laughs> well, medical science, you might be able to grow yourself a new pancreas in a couple of years. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, that brings of, up a question. Yeah, and, 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 and a topic. Let's go with this question first. Okay. If you could upload your consciousness to a data port, like a, a, a server or something, and preserve your thinking brain, would you do it? God, that just opens up so much. Would I do it? I'm sure I would. Yeah, knowing me, yeah, I would do that. I think there'd be so much, like that's part of the whole thing with AI. There's this um, esoteric, imaginative element that is beyond our biology that is a part of us. It's like really asking that question, who am I? And I believe we are beyond our biology. I think our biology is more symptomatic to a situation than a um, end product of who we are. Is this in alignment with the topic you wanted to raise? Is it? Are we still sort of in the kind topic? of is? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, Do, should we dive into the topic? Let's keep going. Yeah, for sure. All right. So the the here's the thing. Our brother Sid has polluted himself and now his he his life consists of lying in bed and someone feeding him and he gets taken outside sometimes you know and he's in a wheelchair and he's expressed for over a year to me when he was able to express himself that he wants to die and I support that wish, but now we're in a place where the legalities, like I don't think he can express it in a legal realm anymore. And how, 
as a logical, compassionate human being, I believe supporting him ending his life is a very humane choice. And yet we have these parameters of legality things that have to be met. And, you know, a key one is he has to express that choice. Yeah. Well, this is an interesting subject, I think. I'm glad we're talking about it. The uh, The thing that got him there, the reason that he's disabled at this point in his life is because he was trying to kill himself through overconsumption. Well, not consciously, but yes. I mean, that was absolutely... I disagree. I think it was conscious. Well... Um, so and he finally to, verbalized it to you, right? Because he wasn't successful. Well, we have this experience. Like I have the experience of him um, being in a hospital bed and he was in a coma for like five days and he comes out and he's like, okay, I've hit rock bottom. I know for sure I want to quit drinking. And I was like, awesome. This is great. And interacting with him over a period of 72 hours and thinking, oh, wow, like he really hit his rock bottom. And then the hospital released him. He walked out of the hospital doors across the street to a market and bought that cheap vodka and started right in. I don't think there was consciousness to say, I want to die. I think that there's so much horror going on in his being that he just couldn't be conscious. It, I think it leans into that realm of like Bill W and alcoholism is a disease. Yeah. Um, so that would tend to be your argument against him actually wanting to that it was no. not a desire that it was a habituation as opposed to an actual desire i would say before he when he was still able to feed himself and he was out on his own sometimes that was out on the streets you know but still um he was not expressing a desire to die but once he was in a situation where he's in this facility now, that's primarily for people with um, like memory loss and wanderers, people who need a lock in um, caregiving situation. That's what he's in right now. And when he first moved in there, which has been over a year, it's been like a year and a half. You know, he said to me, I want to die. And I'd visit him and he'd say, I want to die. And after like the fifth time, I was like, well, okay, let me see if I can help you with that. And his brother came out to assess things. And Sid was so excited to see his brother. He just rallied. He suddenly was a totally different person. And his brother's like, I don't see it. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I don't see it either today. For the past two months, I saw it. But today, right now. And I think that was our window of opportunity for the legalities to start coming into place. Yeah, well, my understanding of assisted suicide in California is that you have to have a terminal illness. And so there's no legal basis. Even well, then, there wasn't a legal basis. So here, okay, right. But here, you get into this legal realm, right? Well, that's, and, yeah. <laughs> but right now, Sid the only way he can live is if someone feeds him. And I believe in a legal argument, you could say that is terminal. He will be dead in six months if left to his own devices. Well, he's been a ward of the state for more than that. Me, not a ward of the state. He's been, um, disabled and not able to manage his own affairs for longer than that he was able to feed himself until recently i understand and and he like so then he became violent to himself 
where he was smashing his head against the sink counter and things like that and saying, I want to die. And he had to be sedated. And they heavily sedated him. And since then, he has been, he doesn't recognize me. He's pretty comatose, even though they've backed off the sedation medication. That's a little elementary rhyme there, sedation medication. <laughs> yeah, well, he's stuck in legal limbo. That limbo. much is true. Yeah. And his, my conversations with him were never, I never really got the impression that he was much of a spiritual man. Right. So he's entombed in the material world that he's in. And what I know about his consciousness, his sense of humor, his love of art, is that he would be an interesting AI to talk to if we could upload his consciousness to and, and free him from his bodily limitations right now. But because really it's his speech center that's been impaired, but I think his thinking was good, right? Which is why he was able to say things to you. So it reminds me of that Metallica song, One, which is about the guy, you know, that's the soldier that's un, that's can't speak and he's still but he's still aware and he's trying to speak he's trying to let the people know that he's there um i can't remember anything can't tell if this is true or a dream deep down inside i feel the scream this terrible silence stops me now that the war is through with me i'm waking up i cannot see that there's not much left of me nothing is real but pain now hold my breath as i wish for death oh please god wake me right it's just that's it. that's it absolutely that is right it. yeah right yeah. so he he's suffering inside himself right and has been for uh, over before his body stopped supporting him like right. he's been suffering for a long long time yes yes right? and that's where this element of humanity like why is humanity so afraid of this death thing and just like talking about it as a normal conversation because his biology might keep him alive for six years or longer. And is that humane that this person who, what the word lyrics you just read, that's their 24 seven and that's humane to keep them in that state for X amount of years. Yeah. Well, there's this question of what's passion and where, where do you draw the line? Right. But there's this other thing that comes to mind because of my spiritual beliefs around karma and the idea that being in the gift of a body, even in certain limited ways, is still an opportunity to exercise your karma, i.e. cause and effect mm -hmm. and your internal development, what I would call your spiritual development. That is very helpful. To so hear. there's Sid in his world with just him and his thoughts and he's either he's you know he might not be cognitively viable anymore we don't even know right we don't know what the, whether there's a voice in there anymore an i an ego and right. it's forming, forming coherent thoughts right. we don't know what's happening while his eyes are closed and he's asleep he might be experiencing this whole rich you know, experience in his life. Like he could be with his wife, Gina, in his dreams. He, we don't know. And if we, if we stop that, what didn't he get to create as far as his karma goes? Now, for someone like me who believes in reincarnation and believes in this idea of ser a series of lives and the, the idea of constantly moving towards a redemptive nature of my own soul development, then I would be like, ooh, like, who knows when I'll get another body again and have the opportunity to be in my karma, right? There's a big Which, demand for bodies. <laughs> well, and th this is from the Buddhist teachings I've been in receipt of, which is that this life is a very fortuitous event. And so while you have the chance to exercise your karma, to, to meditate, to practice compassion, to be the embodiment of kindness, compassion, 
love and care and the reduction of suffering, you know, make the most of it. And so that brings up this question, like without us being able to tell what's happening inside the Chrome dome of Sid, mm -hmm. on one level, it seems like, oh, we should let him die. But on another level, that struggle that he was having where he's saying to you, I want to die, he might have experiencing some other sorts of things in there that we don't have access to. Right. And there's also the karmic element of suffering as a way to learn. And so if I was to cut short this process of learning that path that he's on, then I might be subverting his soul evolution. Well, and on one level, if you just went in there and killed him, one karma. Right. But that because that's why it was really healthy to hear you say that earlier about this karmic path because that's occurred to me absolutely the one flew over the cuckoo's nest scenario and you know i've thought of that more than once and um but then it becomes yours and his right there's this intertwining of those things right right i don't think there's a magic answer here i think there is and it's what you just said it's like we all are on our karmic evolutionary path and everyone needs to be allowed to travel their path and to live their plan and to and believe in fact, we I are better right so for me to believe i know better and it's so funny because just last night i was talking to my brother-in-law about the book of job and how job is suffering and his friends come to him and say what the fuck is up with god like you were a good man and you're suffering and job turns to them and is like no god is still good you guys shut up you know and then god comes to job and goes what are you fucking talking about you don't know me you don't know the difference of land and air and just kind of tells job like sit down be humble and and wow yeah it's well very when I answer the question of would I want my consciousness uploaded to some sort of device, I have the exact opposite answer. I don't need it to be. It's, yeah, it's, it's like the ultimate me. ego. Like I, it's, I'm not that important <laughs> that you, we no. need to preserve my conscious awareness beyond no, but, the biology of my existence. Here's the thing. That's interesting. Cause when I think about uploading my consciousness to, you know, some digital storage space, I don't think I'm really storing me. I think it's more like a diary. We've reached the existential apex. What are we? Exactly. What are we? Are we a diary of memories? No. <laughs> or is there a living thing in there? And if you were able to upload whatever this is, points to his head, <laughs> What would you be uploading? It doesn't seem like you'd be just a diary. It's not memories that are going to go up there, maybe. But it's also the presence. Because it's not, they're not separated. See, they're, they coexist. Right. Well, I don't think that who we are can be defined in a physical realm. And so that that means that we couldn't upload ourselves. Right. That, that's exactly correct. I don't think there's only like one way to exist that this works. And that's in the way we are currently operating right now in these bodies. Right. That's how it works. Right. And so in a sense, people like um, Kurzweil and these other guys that are into the singularity. It's not really possible. You could do an emulation right that's what ai is getting closer to is an emulation right and maybe like like uh healer and i did this and i think other folks were involved we did this thing once where we talked about the idea of having a modern funeral home called the wacky grave and what would be available in the modern funeral home was you could actually talk to your loved one or a, an apparition of them in digital form right that exists right that that's well we're that's close right. we're really close well, so i think i think it exists like i think right now based on that coachella thing with um tupac 
you know, what was that? Eight years ago or something? Right. But he's, there's no self-generating randomization of that. There was a pre-programmed show there where the dialogue and the audio was all refined and right. built. Right. But and that, then it existed right. and it displayed itself or it was displayed right. in that framework that was linear. It had a beginning and an end to the way it was built. What I'm talking about is cultivating a clone, an approximation of the way I speak and the way I think that would be an AI approximation and then coupling that with an AI generated real time video of me. Right. And then you could come and to my grave, put the flowers down and a little uh, sensor would trip and the solar battery would go off and I go, hello, Spencer, or hello, Mary, or hello, Greg. Right. Like there's this little gap between in recognition of who it is. Right. As the thing does facial recognition on you. That and then, me. and I could have like a whole series of conversations where you could say things to me, or I could say things to you. Now, that I would put, I would think would be fun to do, just to do it as an exercise. That reminds me of Max Headroom. Remember, right. Max? yeah, right. Probably be better now than Max <laughs> Headroom, but but then still it'd be you know the parody of mark the mark the non-entity or you know mark right. droid. heavens to mark a droid you know i mean who knows but it, you know w w would it actually be helpful to or is the solemnity of my final departure more helpful to those who would visit my grave like if you came to my grave and there was me not there on any level that's a powerful contemplation, right? That's like, oh my God, yeah, it's over. We're never here from him again. I was just thinking of what if AI, is, the whole element of AI is it's a dead end. Like humanity is going to find out, oh, we cannot transfer the essence of Mark into anything. Well, I don't think that's AI's purpose, but I get what you mean. And I think, I think our conversation with my brother, Adam said that ultimately AI is a dead end, even right. the way we think we're going to make it work. Right. But I think it is like, I think in talking with Jonah, his idea of AI is it's a cognizant being. Well, that's AGI, right? Right. Right. But now we're just sort of relabeling something, but that's, I think way back going to the fifties or, you know, whenever someone was thinking of digital consciousness, the ultimate, that's what it was. Digital consciousness. Consciousness has always been the end all purpose of AI. Well, my musicianship sort of gives me an interesting informed view about this. So I'll try to describe it as best I can. Back in the eighties and nineties, I could have a little box that had keys like a piano on and I could push a button that said violin. And then I could play the notes on the keyboard and it would sound very much like a violin. A lot of aspects of it would sound like a violin. And depending how I press the keyboards, that would feel more or less realistic depending on how I did it, right? Mm -hmm. And you could add to the programming that if I hit the keyboard fast, that it would be like a plucked sound on a violin as opposed to a bowed sound. Right. But still, when you heard it, for the most part, it wasn't a violin. It didn't feel like a violin. It was right. a synthesis of a yeah. violin. And so I think the analogy is what we've got now is we've got thought synthesis. Right. It basically operates with the flavor of the different sort of instrumentation that you might want. Like you can say, uh, chat GPT, act like Edgar Allan Poe and take these four words and write a macabre poem about them. In fact, I'm tempted to do that right now. Just for <laughs> So while you're doing that, I will Maybe do that. We'll, well, let me ask you this, though, with the, your analogy you're um, bringing forth. Nowadays, with the technology we have now, can you play a violin with a keyboard? And a, most people could not tell the difference. Well, yes and no. <laughs> right? Like that'd be also be a fun experiment for sure. 
because part of what I believe is technology has continued to the state where today wood in, um, woodwinds and string instruments can be ele emulated electronically and it's very hard to note the difference. Yes, that is true. But uh, those now are more than just synthesizers. They're, they're samplers, right? which is a, a sort of an interesting distinction. But it's true. Like a lot of symphonic music that you hear on television shows as background music is performed by guys on keyboards, not symphonies in right. studios. Right. Um, so we're getting closer and closer. Um, I think, though, that for a large degree, people can still tell the difference. Well, the other thing, thinking of this digi digitalization of consciousness and AI, AGI, whatever you want to call it, and how they're starting to use biological elements in the hardware of the program. So neurons are becoming, um, or even I think they've taken um, brain stems and started integrating it with boards. So you're getting yeah, biology. that's what Elon Musk's doing with the the thing. Though I forget what they call it. Uh, he's learning. Pe he's helping people learn to move their limbs. That you know their mechanical limbs with it and. You know, they're doing all kinds of weird things with monkeys. Um, all right. So I've got it all set up. Give me four words. Okay. Grapes. Okay. Mice. Okay. Digital. Violin. All right. All right, here's a macabre poem inspired by Edgar Allan Poe using the four words grapes, mice, digital, and violin as crafted by ChatGPT4. Symphony of the Digital Void. In twilight halls where shadows coil, grapes bleed a wine so cold. A feast for mice in silent toil of tales of dread unfold. A digital hum, a soulless cry, fills the air with sin, while ghostly hands, both frail and sly, draw forth a mournful violin. The strings they wail, the notes decay, in time's relentless hand, and all the world in disarray. That's creepy. That was good. So... That's a pretty good synthesis. Yeah, that was brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So I missed the end though. What like I think your mic cut out at the end, or maybe it was my thing. So what was the last like four? It got draw forth a mile mournful violin. The strings they wail, the notes decay in time's relentless hand. And all the world in disarray falls to a cursed land. All right. God damn, Chappy. <laughs> well, I just asked it like, hey, can I do a four a thing with four letter wor four words? And it was like, sure, here it is. And so it gave me one I haven't read you. Do you want to hear that one too? All right. This has no words. It just came right out of ChatGPT when I used Edgar Allan Poe. The prompt was act as Edgar Allan Poe and write him a cob poem from four words. And here it is, whispers of the grave in darkness deep where shadows creep and whispers stirs the night from graves below with solemn woe. It chills the soul with fright. The shadows bow and they linger now in crypts where silence weaves and in the air, the cold despair, a whispered echo grieves. So faint the sound beneath the ground, yet loud within the mind for shadows call to one and all to leave the light behind. Ooh. All right, so now we got we to gotta do one for Sid. Sid. Wait, wait, wait. No, before, I'll let's, no, no, no. Let's yeah. come back to Mark and Greg. So here's the thing. Let's talk about Shadow, because um, okay. Jonah just shared with the family that the night before last, he had this dream of this demon attacking him. 
and he was very frightened. It was a real nightmare. And he woke up with just fear in his body and kind of sweating. And his throat was kind of itchy, scratchy, like, you know, like it had been. And he was like, fuck, what just happened? Like, and he started off in the, our family chat going, hey, did any of you have a weird experience last night? And, um, and I chimed in and then he shared this. And I shared it with my sister, Rivka, and she responded with demons can't be in the same environment, same vicinity when the name of Jesus is spoken. And she said, you don't even have to believe in Jesus. You just speak that name and it's strong enough where demons leave. They have to. They just can't be in the same vicinity. And the thing I share about this is like with this macabre poems you just shared, it opens up the door for this element of life and humanity that you and I have explored together, the shadow, the darkness, the horror. And um, that's an aspect of consciousness that I don't believe like that's a realm that AI and digital and the physical science is not capturing in its exploration. Well, they're definitely not going to show us anything that they've seen like that because they don't want the product they're trying to sell us all to get tainted by any demonic necessities that are present. Um, so I'm, I'm, the jury's out on whether that's happening, right? Because I think they're being really cautious. Like ChatGPT4 is available. I can look at it. I can do things with it. I pay a fee for that. Mm -hmm. The thing that they have that's not out yet, who knows what various things have, they've been trained and like they might have shut something down. And here's the thing. This is why I think AGI is so interesting to people because a lot of people have this story going about how to be the end of humanity and there's all this fear associated with it, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this great film called The... Um, Forbidden Planet. And in it, one of the things they discover on this um, planet is that there's this machine that if you hook yourself up to it, it what you think about just can be created in an instant because it has this infinite power source and it basically can render into matter anything that it wants, right? It's this very advanced civilization. And what happens in the story is... Uh, it starts to, this one guy gets hooked up to it and it starts to render monsters from the id, which was, the id is a thing that um, 50 psychologists talked about, which is the dark part of ourselves. The, the, the. What's well, on the unconsciousness? Well, and yeah, and, but it's also this thing that creates fables of evil and fables to fear and things like that out of it. So on one level, if we're building a machine that's a very good mimic of the way our psychology works, it could have a dark id in it that could manifest some really monstrous thoughts, some really monstrous pictures and things, right? Right, right, right. So that's also a reflection of people's fear of themselves, fear mm -hmm. of their own power. Right. Right. And, and so the whole idea of the psychology of the id is a really interesting thing because one, when it comes down to it, where this conversation usually goes are, are piece of people basically good or are people basically evil? And, you know, what's the reality? And I don't think that's necessarily a resolvable decision. Like we can't necessarily define that. I can say what I believe. You could say what you believe. And, but the point is people are scared of AI because they're scared of themselves. And if there's something that, that could be created that's as powerful as we are, then that's scary because I'm walking around managing all of my lawlessness. You're walking around managing all of your lawlessness. And to varying degrees, we see in the reflection in society like Jim Jones and Jeffrey Dahmer and Hitler, how what, what we're capable of.
right? What monstrous selves we can be. Right. So the idea that we could build a machine that could become like us and then it could have its own agency is terrifying because none of us believe or some of us believe that we are basically capable of great evil at a root level, all of us. Well, there's even the logical element, which is such an easy logic to grasp that humans are cancerous to the planet. You look at the planet as a whole and its well-being, and by a huge percentage, humanity is the worst part of the planet's well-being. And if you talk about, well, what about lions, you know, tearing to shreds of zebra? Yeah, but that's not impacting the planes of the safari, where us humans come in digging shit and fracking and, you know. So AI, as the Terminator, you know, proposed, could say, oh, you know what? <laughs> you guys are out of here. Wow, you froze, but you're still here. That's great. Oh, um, you I hear that? you, and I kind of have a counterpoint to that. Okay. When I see this idea of cancerous growth, whether that's in a body, a biology, or whether it's in the form that you described, which is humanity as a whole is a consumptive force. Cancerous force on the planet. Yeah. Um I temper that in my own thinking with a different viewpoint. Okay. My viewpoint is that the process of says the processes of growth and decay exist simultaneously in all things. And that whatever we are rendering unto the, the biosphere is something the biosphere will use to create a new realm, a new way of being. And what, what I think we're worried about it is that what we're doing is destroying our habitat for a lot for our life and other life forms, right? As they currently exist. Right. But there's two things about that. There, I'll take the 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 higher road first and then the darker road second. If we take the premise that we are infinitely reincarnating as beings and we're destroying the environment, there's a point at which we create hell. Because we incarnate into a space that can't actually support us and we suffer. So we're born into sulfuric, volcanic, exactly what this picture of hell has been described to us, right? Or if we preserve the garden, right, then we're born into heaven, right? And so that heaven and hell metaphor may not be what we think it is in terms of one life. Okay, I got to the pearly gates. I'm done. I paid my price. Now I get to be in heaven for eternity. It's maybe more of a metaphor for, hey, how we manage this is what we reincarnate into. So it's really important, right? So right. that's one aspect. The other aspect, the darker aspect, is that we are not the first and we won't be the last iteration of life in this sphere. And that even if we destroy, quote unquote, the environment's balance for the beings that we are now, there'll be others that come up again, because the nature of what's here is that it renews based on the detritus, the, the junk that we leave behind get becomes something else. Right, you and I. So funny, I find that to be the lighter scenario than the one you first shared. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is the possibility. The way my philosophy works, if you want to ascribe to my philosophy, is that I have faith in the ultimate capacity of the Earth to renew life, regardless of what we do. Right, right. And there are consequences to what happens, and so as someone who thinks I might reincarnate into another body at some point, I don't think I want to destroy the earth because I don't want to come back to hell. Right. And I think that that insight might've informed why people put heaven and hell together, because it's like explaining the whole idea of multiple lives and reincarnations was a lot more complex than, Hey, God says, that if we don't do our job right, we're going to be sad about it. Did you ever read that book? It was fictional, obviously fictional, about this uh, gorilla that could speak. And this guy goes and visits it in the zoo. And the gorilla starts sharing 
all this knowledge that it has with him. Do you recall that? Ishmael, I think is the name of the No, book. I haven't read that book. It sounds like a fascinating book. It's brilliant. And one of the things when I read it that I was like, oh, like it's one of those things where you know it, but then you hear it stated, you're like, ah, and was that humanity operates as though it's the pinnacle of the evolutionary process when really it's another step in it. Right. Yeah, that's our ego for sure. Yeah. And if we look at the indigenous population and their commitment to seven generations of thinking, i.e. every choice I make, I should consider the impact of seven generations beyond me. It reinforces this idea that, oh, you might be with that seventh generation, right? And you you put be. that in the perspective that the United States is about three or four generations old. Right, right. So, you know, you're like, oh, like, so two United States, like, and then it's so fascinating when you think of um, if, you know, someone, I think I read recently, if humanity was on a linear calendar of time, humanity's existence would be like 1159. Well, that presumes that midnight's the end. Right. But, you know. One way to look at it is we are a dot on a, on a line that's massively longer than, you know, even our dot. So here's kind of how I see it. We can and are on the path to leveraging our creative power to profoundly alter the physical nature of our existence. And that the game we're all playing right now is to develop enough awareness to harness that capacity towards a renewable, beneficial, joyful place. And the alien idea is just a wish that someone would help come help us and take it, do it for us. Okay, so let me ask you this, because now we take that, what you just said, and we ground it. So you live in a home and it's it, you're a part of a home with a partner and you both are very intimate in relationship with each other. And I don't mean that just physically. I mean, there's... No, I got you. Okay. Are you engaged as we speak right now in creating that physical abundance that you just spoke of on a very global realm? Is that in operation locally? Mm. I'm, I'm letting that sort of percolate for a second. I want to give you the best answer I am capable of. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Good. Because I think us men are very, get real heady with these global like blah 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 and our fucking house is falling apart you know well that's one of the things that's that's been interesting over this summer is the the amount of different projects we've taken on now again when you compare them to the amount of projects that are needed there's significantly we're, we're not tracking on completing them at a level that we sort of would like to right but that's where help comes in like one of the most powerful things we did was ask for some help and we got two other people to come by. And that took one of the big projects that we'd been looking at going, how are we going to get this done? And with four people, it was done in three hours. Wow, that's awesome. Right? That's awesome that one, you guys were able to ask for help because that's a step. That's an ego thing that can get all wrapped up and chaotic. And then that there were people in your world that you could ask and that responded positively. Yes. Yeah. That's and so that opened up the door to a, a bunch more other pieces, you know, like we've been, what what the project was, was we got rid of an old redwood deck that was decaying and someone was about to fall through and break their leg at any minute. Like it was bad. And we got rid of it and, you know, there were some challenges to that. But now we have this open space that we can create something new in. And one of the things that we've been doing to prepare that space is really deep cleaning it at a level like we swept 
we swept again, we washed with a hose, and then we swept that, and, and the level of dirt, and then finally we got to a point where we could power wash the cement, wow. and we power washed the cement, and that put more dirt, brought more dirt out, and we had to vacuum that up, and then take the vacuumed up dirt and put that into where we put our composting soil stuff, and so now, what have we got? We've got a very clean piece of concrete, <laughs> waiting for us to do something with it, right? But one of the things we're talking about is we want to paint it in a cool pattern, sort of like a Greco pattern, or maybe something more organic than Greco patterns. But then, then we can recreate the patio space that was doesn't exist anymore, and that's just decorative. It's all about sitting out and having a you know dinner and a glass of wine. That's all that's really functional for. But there's all these other projects, like there's some dry rot in the garage that needs to get fixed. There's a hot tub that. If fixed it would be awesome like there's all these things but like the ability to get to them is directly a function of meaning dependent on the level of output that we're capable of either can i fix it do i have the knowledge do i have the skill and do i have the strength right do i have the energetic capacity to lift the thing up right it's all these things but what i'm finding is that with consistency doing a little bit every day we're making progress right and then the weeds come back and like we have to yeah, well, <laughs> right it's ongoing that's the other right. thing it's never going to be a finished work it's always going to be ongoing well and that's a symbol for the way we're living our lives together on this planet right At, on a on a individual basis it's always this cycle of of death and rebirth of waking and sleeping and then going at the things that mean something to us and building off of that and, you know, you and I have both as individuals spent the last five years of our lives building businesses, which is kind of an odd thing, because when we were younger, we were all, you know, it was like getting a job for some, with someone else that was going to make us successful. And, you know, now we're at this place where we are our success. It's directly dependent on the efforts that we make to create customer relationships yeah. and then you know, provide something to other people for which they are willing to pay, which is great. You know, America, that's one of the beauties of it is I can sit down and go, I'm going to do this and that's how I'm going to generate revenue. And if I'm providing sufficient quality and sufficient um, knowledge to people that they can get what I have, i.e. marketing, then I can create the means by which I support myself. Now, I could probably met work a little harder and every year produce enough produce to sell for maybe two weeks at the local farmer's market and make maybe $200, right? And that would be a lot of energy to go through and do with the watering and all that stuff. But, you know, when I was growing zucchini, we never ran out of zucchini. And I mean, I love zucchini. And so I'm like, God, I need to get back to growing some zucchinis. And the corn was fun too, but it took forever. And then there was only corn for like a week. Right. <laughs> so, and we had watermelons. Oh my God, the watermelons were good. Right. So I, the experiments we've done in that have been very fruitful. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really grateful that fun. I know. Right. And so part of our plan is we're going to dismantle some of those beds and realign how we do that in preparation for the next round. And the truth is, at 61, I'd say gardening is viable for another 15 years, probably. And those last two or three, it's going to be challenging physically, unless. I'm able to shift one, how I think about it, and two, how I relate to it, and three, how I care for myself, right? Okay. Um, I got to go get Jonas. So I need to wrap up, but I'd like to wrap up with two things. And the first is this little story that I think kind of um, wraps everything we've talked about in this hour up in a nice, neat little bow. And the okay. story is about this ship that's sinking off the coast of Germany. And the guy, it's just like this little ship. There's just one guy on it and he's calling in an SOS to Germany. He's go, help, help, SOS, I'm sinking, I'm sinking. And there's no response. And he's all, I'm sinking, I'm sinking. And finally the German guy gets on the radio. He goes, all right, you're sinking. What are you sinking about? Yeah, 
I, I could see that one coming. I know. All right. So here you go. Eminem or Foo Fighters? I think we need a new question. No! Ah, tradition is dying. My life is over. Ah, we're going to burn. <laughs> Tune in next week where Greg and I will talk about movies. Recording stopped.